Good morning. <laughs> so I do want to first thank Tom and Katie and the whole Bird Brain team for inviting me. I'm kind of honored, and what you said was so sweet. I consider Katie like a very close friend, and so the fact that she trusts me to kind of give this talk to you guys um, is really profound in my life. Um, so I really thought a lot about what I wanted to talk about. Um, and normally when I give talks, I talk about what I do at Seismic. So Seismic is the Center for Education, Integrating Science, Mathematics, and Computing. We're an outreach center at Georgia Tech, and my position is school partnership. So I spend 99% of my time working with teachers, helping them to kind of figure out what they want to do in their classroom to engage their students. And a lot of that involves Hummingbird, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to give a different kind of talk, because as I thought about what I wanted to say, I realized that I could, like you guys are here, you're going to learn a lot about bird brain, you're going to learn a lot about Hummingbird. But I wanted to be vulnerable and share about myself and talk about this idea of the stories that we tell. So this conference is called Catalyze Learning. So that was kind of the, the grounding of my talk, right? So what does catalyze mean? It's a verb, right? It's an action, right? So it means to begin, to cause something to begin. So then in me, that made me think about, well, what was my beginning? So this is me as a baby. I know, I was like the cutest thing ever, right? <laughs> right? So this is me as a baby, right? And there's this story that I tell when people say, oh, how did you get to your position at Georgia Tech? There's this story that I always tell. It's the same story that I always tell. It starts with, I've always loved math. For as long as I can remember, I've always loved math. So this is an article that was written in the local paper when I was in the eighth grade. That's me, right? <laughs> Talking about how much I love math, right? In the eighth grade, right? So then, of course, I went to Spelman, got, got accepted to Spelman, got a degree in math and computer science, went to grad school, got my PhD in educational technology. The rest of it is history, blah, 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 right? That's the story that we tell. That's what people's bios look like. But the problem when we tell these stories is that it doesn't talk about all the other paths that we could have taken. Right? It implies that life is this straight line, right? You pick a path, you keep moving down that path, there's no hurdles that you have to go over, there's no obstacles in your way, you just keep moving forward. And we all know that that's not true, right? There are these other paths that we could have taken that for some reason or another we chose not to take. And that's what I want to talk about today, is that other path that I didn't take that I could have taken. So we're going to go back to the beginning. This is me as a baby, right? Remember this cute little girl? That's me. It is me, right? But what I didn't talk about were these two people. These are my parents, Kent and Renee Pearson. They both worked for IBM, right? So, this is a picture that was taken at the Atlanta Motor Speedway in 1976. That's my dad, right? That was a picture for IBM, right? My dad started working for IBM in 1972. My mother started working for IBM in 1976. So when I say I have been around computers my entire life, I have been around computers my entire life, okay? So, the early part of my childhood was spent in Atlanta, Georgia. But what I didn't know till recently was that I was considered to be part of the integration of Atlanta Public Schools in the 1970s. Right? This is a picture from um, a book that was written about Virginia Highlands, which I know Ms. Tanner knows very much about Virginia Highlands. She teaches kids that live in that neighborhood now. Right? And if that's me in that picture, that's the same picture. Right? And it's talking about that only five years before is when Atlanta Public Schools was actually finally integrated. Okay? So my life story has always been about being the only one. Right? And it continued. Right? There I am as a brownie. Right? The only one that looks like me. Okay? So as a young child, there were two people that I absolutely adored and wanted to be like. Wonder Woman <laughs> and Ramona Quimby. Right? Those were the people that I looked up to. One was a woman sent to save the earth and her man. Right? <laughs> the other was a precocious child whose imagination always got the best of her. Right? And got her into precarious situations. Both of them were white. I also started programming at a very young age. I was lucky enough to go to a school where they use Logo, right, to teach robotics to young kids. 
I was hooked. I had computers at home. I was learning coding in school. But because my parents worked for IBM and Logo was for the Apple, I learned how to program in basic at home. Right? I was teaching myself basic programming because I was just fascinated by that. And as a very young child, my parents got us, me and my older brother, they got us a computer so that we could have our own computer to do whatever we wanted to. So then the summer after fifth grade, before I went to middle school, I went to computer camp because isn't that what every kid does, right? Isn't that what all the cool kids are doing? They're going to computer camp right when they're 10 years old. So I went to computer camp. And the reason I went to computer camp is because these were the things that were influencing my life at that time, right? It was Molly Ringwald and Pretty and Pink, right? She was the, the girl that didn't care what anybody else thought, right? So I was like, I'm going to be the girl that doesn't care what anybody else thinks. I like computers, so I'm going to go to computer camp, right? It was weird science, which now that I look back on it, probably not the most appropriate movie, right? It's about two white guys, two white teenagers that are really good with computers. They're nerds. So they can't get a girl, so they make a girl, <laughs> right? They build their own girl. I love the Sweet Valley High books, right? These, all of them, exactly, right? But they were also very sexual books that were really inappropriate for kids, but we didn't know any better at the time, right? And these were the things I was doing on my computer. I was playing this game, Tapper. How many of you remember? Does anybody remember Tapper? Thank you, yes! It was awesome, but it was about serving beer, right? You were trying not to let the beer fall on the ground, right? And then I was also playing Carmen San Diego, right? Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? The things that I was doing as a kid. But when I look back at my picture, this is my picture from computer camp. Once again, I was the only one, right? So I was constantly being told, you don't belong here, right? Not by anybody actually saying those words to me, but by looking at who was around me, okay? So let's keep going. So this is an alternative to that. This is the Hollis Bridge Summer Program at Georgia Tech. So Hollis is a school on the west side of Atlanta. It's in a predominantly African-American community, very under-resourced community. And we bring those kids onto our campus for two weeks every summer before their sixth grade year. So a very different type of summer experience than the one that I had before my sixth grade year. So they come on campus, they swim every day, they read every day. This year they, <clears throat> they read The Wild Robot, which is a wonderful book if you have not read it, especially well connected to The Hummingbird. And the reason we picked it is because they're also doing robotics using the Hummingbird Robotics Kit. Because we want them to see themselves as the future of computer science, the future of engineering. And so they're making a robot that is connected to that book. So here's a short little video, and I did not check my sound, so we will see how this goes. <laughs> a short little video. But, um, the fox was trying to hunt for food, and it was hunting the porcupine. And the porcupine attacked, attacked him or her, and now it has quills all in its face. And Roz is trying to help out um, the fox and take all the quills out. Is her hand moving? Oh, there it goes. It just turned. She's so kind. The, um, the tablet just turned off. She's so kind. She's so great. So this is a robot. So they went, read the wild robot, and then they all created Roz. Roz is the robot in that book, right? They all created Roz. But then they had to go back and do a close read of one chapter that stood out to them, and they had to pick a character from that chapter. And if you've read that book, each chapter is about a different animal. And so this student picked the, porcu the story of the porcupine and the fox. Right, so this is Roz trying to help the porcupine, I mean, help the fox get the quills from the porcupine out of her skin. So, back to me though. So remember this article, right, that was written about advanced mathematics students in the eighth grade. So, but the, the story I always tell is about my role in that article, but the one that's really important is this person. This was my teacher in the eighth grade. And when I was in the eighth grade and in his class, he said to me, Tamara, take the timber out of your voice. Wow. Right, exactly. And if you know what that word means, it basically means you're talking too loud, right? You need to take, you need to soften your voice, right, and bring it down because you're being too loud. That stuck with me. And it was very many years later before I found my voice again. I completely quieted myself based on the comment of one teacher in my favorite class, my math class, right? So we have to think about what we're saying to kids, not just what the content that we're teaching, 
but how are we interacting with the students in our class? So what if I had a teacher like Ms. Igmarese, who's a teacher in, a, in Fulton County Schools, who implemented a home and bird project. So here's a video. My name is Shirley Igmarese, and I'm from Sandtown Middle School. I'm the visual arts teacher there at the Sandtown Middle School. And we recently, um, well, I teach all the great levels there, but this project here that we're working on now is for it's my advanced honors art class, visual arts. This is extremely new for me mm -hmm. and for my students, but it was really a challenge and it was also an awesome experience for my students because I always say, think outside the box. And this has really compelled them to think outside the box with coding, robotics, and then 2D and then 3D. So this has been an awesome, awesome experience for my students and for me as a teacher. I have learned a lot myself. And the students, my most important factor for me is my, are my students. For them to have this kind of experience, to come to the High Museum, working with Seismics, working with uh, your team too, and working with um, other components of the, of the visual arts. So this is for me just an awesome creative experience for my students. So that is Shirley Barese. She's an art teacher in Fulton County School. And that was the Art in Motion project that Katie was talking about when she introduced me. So that's a project that was born out of, actually I saw Jane was here yesterday. Um, I don't think she's here today. But out of Jane Sweet's movie masterpieces. We wanted to take that project and kind of take it to the next level. So instead of students replicating um, famous works of art, they were going to be inspired by works of art and create completely new pieces of their own that were inspired by what they saw. So we took them to the High Museum, which is the large museum, the large art museum in Atlanta. They had a tour of an exhibit of civil rights photography because the teacher was really focused that semester on helping them to find their voice, helping them to learn how to advocate for themselves. And so we really wanted them to connect to kind of the historical civil rights movement in Atlanta and bring that back to their own art. And so what we did was we took them to the high, they saw the exhibit. What you saw in that video was them taking photographs of the pieces that really inspired them. And then they did sketches, they created robots based on those pieces. And then the most important part that you saw at the end when, when you saw the final robots was that those robots were back at the High Museum. It's really important that kids have an authentic audience for the work that they're creating. Yes, parents are wonderful. Yes, teachers are wonderful to see. When they see their parents, they see their teachers every single day. They want, if I'm creating a work of art, I want artists in that community to see what I am creating. That is the authentic art audience for that, for that project. So we took them back. So that was a partnership between Georgia Tech, Fulton County Schools, and the High Museum. And that's something that all of you can do in your classrooms, right? Connect with, and it doesn't have to be art. If you're a science teacher, connect with your local science center, right? Just finding an authentic audience for the work that your kids are creating. So, that's me again, <laughs> right? So then I went to high school, right? And in high school, it was all about one thing. America won the Oh, yeah. Talk to some cute boys that probably are men. Right? <laughs> 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 you can't see them, right? So, as I said, but both of my parents worked for IBM. So I was actually part of the beta test of America Online. I started using America Online in 1990 when it came out to the public for the um, for the PC in 1991, right? So I would be online till like two o'clock in the morning talking to people online. I was amazed by the fact that I could talk to somebody through my computer. I was sending emails, I was instant messaging, I was chatting, I was doing all the things that the young people are doing today, right back in the early 90s. So, but then I was still ready to leave high school because I was tired of being the only one, right? So because I was tired of being the only one, I decided to go to an HBCU for college, right? So my dream was to go to Spelman, I got accepted. I got a small academic scholarship to go to Spelman. And I was planning to be an education major because the story I tell is that I've always wanted to be a teacher. So I was planning to be an education major at Spelman and become a math teacher. But then I got this, right? Life throws these little things, right? I got a scholarship from NASA, right? And it said that they picked me because they saw a future for me in science and in engineering. I'm like, huh, okay. But why did they see a future? So let's look at some data, right? So this says 51% of students who scored in the top 25% on college entrance exams majored in STEM fields, 
and 59.1% of those students graduated, right? So it's a predictor. They're looking at standardized, they're looking at your grades, they're looking at your standardized test scores, they're looking at what you did in, what classes you took in high school. That is how they are predicting how you are going to do in college. But look at these scores from last year, right? So these are SAT scores from last year. 2017 high school graduates who stated that they intended to be computer science majors in college had a mean score of 575 on the mathematics portion of the SAT. But if we look at uh, Latino and African American students, they are falling way below that on the SAT, right? So if, if that's what we are using as a predictor, right, what are we saying about the potential of students of color, right? And nationally, 24% of high achieving blacks and 29% of high achieving Latinos never even take the SAT, right? So the ones that we see the most potential for are not getting those opportunities because they're not even taking the test, okay? Let's look at another statistic, right? 63% of bachelor's degree STEM majors completed calculus or advanced math in their first year of college. Their first year, only 19% took college math. So what is that saying? That's saying if you're coming in needing remedial mathematics, the likeliness that you will complete a STEM degree is only 19%, right? However, if you come in ready to take calculus, your chances go way up. So let's look at how kids are doing in calculus, right, okay? So completion of calculus is, a, is the strongest predictor of enrollment in a STEM major, the strongest predictor, because, and it logically makes sense, right? Kids that are interested in STEM are taking more classes in high school, right? They're there because they're, they have an interest in that, so they're pushing themselves to be prepared for what we say it takes to be a successful major, okay? So, we look at the students that are enrolled. Only 8% of black students, and these are public school statistics, right? 8% of black students and 16% of Latino students are enrolled in calculus in high school, right? So my first inclination whenever I look at data is to go a little deeper because I want to know, well, do they have access, right? But when we look at the access data, right, the majority of students of color do have access to schools. Or they're enrolled in schools where calculus is being offered, but they are not the ones in the calculus class, right? So if we look at our little statistic down here, right, black and Latino students represent only 29% of students passing algebra one in middle school, right? Why is that important? It's important because in order to get to calculus in high school, you have to take algebra in middle school, right? That's part of the pathway. It starts much earlier than when you get to high school. I took algebra, right? You remember that, that article, right? I took algebra in the eighth grade. That way I was able to take calculus when I got to high school. If I had not taken algebra in the eighth grade, I would not have been able to take calculus in high school, okay? And then I became a math major, and the rest is history, right? Okay? The other thing that my scholarship with NASA required was that I be a science or engineering major, right? So the only, I had never heard, so, okay, my parents worked for IBM, but I had never heard of computer science, right? I had been coding since I was a little kid. I had never heard the term computer science, right? The science I knew was the science I was being taught in school. Biology, chemistry, physics. I hated all of them. Right? I did not want to be a science major. I did not know anybody who was an engineering major. I had never taken an engineering class in school, so that wasn't even an option. And honestly, until I looked at this letter recently, I did not even remember that engineering was on the letter. I just remembered I had to be a science major. The only science I liked was math, so I became a math major. That is how I got on that path. I had never intended to be a math major. I had intended to be an education major. But because I had a scholarship that was going to pay for me to go to school for all four years, how am I going to turn that down, right? My path suddenly twists and turns, right? And the other thing is that that is what actually ended up sending me to grad school. Because as I said before, they saw something in me. In the letter it says, we see potential for you as an undergraduate and a graduate, right? And it required that I do research all four years while I was at Spelman. So for four years I was being bombarded by this idea, you will go to grad school. And there was never any mention of education. I never took an education class while I was at Spelman because who has time to take an education class when you're a math major, right? But what I did do was wander over to the computer science department, right? Because this was the dawn of the World Wide Web, right? It was the mid-90s. 
right? And so I was learning how to create web pages. And I created my very first web page. It was called the African American Haven. And it was all about finding and helping people find resources on the internet, specifically for people of color. That was my website, right? And I was my website was featured in Black Enterprise and in some newspaper in Arizona because there were so few websites that were doing that at that time. So even though mine was just this very rinky dink thing that I was coding in HTML, it was still something that was out there for people to look at. So when I left Spelman, I said, I'm going to forget this math thing. I love computer science. So I'm going to get my PhD in computer science. But remember what I told you at the beginning, that's not actually what I got my PhD in, right? After when I when I so why didn't I get my PhD? It's because in 1996, only three out of the 514 PhDs in computer science went to black women. Three. None of them were from the University of Florida. When I got to my department, I was one of only two black women in my department. And after two years, I left. I couldn't take it anymore. The isolation, I couldn't take it. So I left and I went back to what I said I wanted to do, which was education. And that's how I ended up with a PhD in educational technology. Right? And we're back where we started. So what was missing? I had two parents that worked for IBM. Right? So I had that. I had, I went to good schools. I had that. I had access to calculus. I had that. But what I didn't have was a role model. In my dissertation, I wrote, I understand how powerful technology is and appreciate its uses. However, I left the graduate computer science program to pursue a degree in education. If someone like me, who had considerable exposure to technology from an early age, still is not interested in being a computer engineer, then what does it take? Okay? So this is my niece, Selma. She's 11. I love her. She loves Minecraft. And anything to do with being on the computer. Right? I know. I know. Um, but her life is different than mine, right? Where I had... I only had Ramona, she had Ada, right? Who's a little girl who loves science. Where I had the Sweet Valley High twins, <laughs> she had Zelly, who's the, the protagonist in Children of Blood and Bone and saves the world from magic, <laughs> right? Where I only had Pretty and Pink and Weird Science, she has Ginger from the Kingsman movie, right? Who's the technological um, marvel of that movie. She has Meg from The New Wrinkle in Time, who saves the world. And most importantly, she has Shuri from Black Panther, who's a genius and does not care who knows it, right? But, these, but all of those characters are fictional characters. Those are not real people. So more importantly, she has people like Dr. Ayanna Howard, who's a roboticist and the chair of interactive computing at Georgia Tech. And she has Raquel Hill, who's an associate professor of computer science at Indiana University, okay? And she also has organizations like Black Girls Code that allow her to be in a space with other people that look like her and learn about computer science and learn from black women who are in that field and have made successful careers for themselves. So, this was IBM, right? Even though my dad wasn't a, a coder, he was still a pioneer at IBM. He was a black man in the 1970s leading sales teams at the biggest computer company in the world during a time when most people didn't know anything about computers. But he was working for a company that to this day has not publicly released its diversity data. But let's look at the companies that have released their data, right? So this is Twitter, Apple, Google, and Facebook, right? The numbers are dreadful, right? Black and brown people continue to be sorely underrepresented in technology. And if we are waiting on these companies to solve the crisis, we will be waiting forever, right? We as educators must create those opportunities by being honest about our stories and sharing the stories of others, by letting them know that life is not a straight line, but a series of branches. We must prepare them for the future that lays ahead of them in order for them to be successful. So how do we do that? There are the three things that we definitely know, right? One is 
academic exposure, right? Kids have to be exposed to technology, they have to be exposed to coding to be able to gain an interest in that, and they need to be exposed in school, right? Completion of calculus in high school, right? Academic rigor, being prepared for what lays ahead in college, comes with being prepared <coughs> in high school. And then performance on college entrance exams, right? Kids have to be able to get into college in order to be able to persist in college, right? So those are the three things that we know. But there are three, and I had all of those things, right? But I still didn't do computer science. So then there are the three things that are even more important. Self-perception, right? Can you see yourself doing this thing that people say that you should be doing, right? Which leads to the second thing, social encouragement. Are those around you encouraging you to follow this path? Are they seeing something in you? And then the last thing is career perception. Do you think that people that look like you do that job, right? So what we know is that successful STEM majors are high achievers at more than just academics. They have high self-efficacy. They understand who they are and who they want to be. And they can see themselves moving towards their next step. So this is my, my pinned Twitter tweet. I guess that's how you say it, right? Because I love my country, I won't uh, normalize the abnormal and justify the unjust. MLK, Gandhi, and many others showed us how. So, when I left my computer science PhD program in 1998, I did not code again for almost 20 years until, because of the satellite network, I met Katie Henry and Bird Brain Technologies. Almost 20 years of not coding. So, what that has done for me has reconnected to me to what I loved as a child, right? And because of that, I've been able to bring that to other children. So, my mission every day, as I continue to push this movement forward, is that not only will young black girls have Shuri and Meg, but that they will also have me as a role model for what they can do. Thank you.